Hi, everyone. Before I begin, I would like to thank all the people who worked countless hours to bring together the first annual Culture Symposium. Bringing together multiple voices and perspectives only deepens our understanding of culture, past, present, and future. I would also like to thank my collaborators, Estrella Magana and the late David Magana. Over the past two decades, collaborative archaeological projects have really taken on a range of strategies that promote the involvement of different publics, including local and descendant communities in practice and knowledge production. In Belize, local communities are being recognized for their contributions to archaeological research of cultural heritage at multiple stages, including research design, data collection, and community outreach. These projects focus on creating a dialogue between local and descendant communities about the deep past and the convergence of living heritage with material remains. My fellow presenters here today also recognize the importance of that convergence for the sustainability and safeguarding of living culture in all its forms. In these same decades, advances in qualitative and quantitative studies of ancient ceramics have allowed us uh, to further understand ancient Maya economy, socio-political structure, artistic traditions, and cultural change over time. For example, my current dissertation project takes a microscopic look at the composition of middle pre-classic ceramics dating to around 600 BC to understand how potters created their wares and traveled across the landscape so many years ago. Compositional studies not only tell us about the formation of the ceramic vessels, but also uh, can help pinpoint uh, the locations on the landscape that ancient potters may have accessed for their materials, um, the materials of their trade. So these methods not only illuminate the distances that ancient potters would, have, would travel to collect raw material or the skill required to create great works of art, they also stand to benefit greatly from collaborative um, research design that incorporates the knowledge and guidance from living traditional potters. In my experience, which I will highlight today, collaboration makes clear the very real factors that influence potter's choice in raw material. Um, these factors include a deep understanding of the materials themselves, a deep understanding of the behavior of the firing environments that they're using, and the formation techniques that allow ceramic vessels to last upwards of 3,000 years. A project design that seeks to integrate archaeological methods and community collaboration must emphasize the importance of local knowledge in the study of ancient Maya ceramics. This paper serves as, as a discussion of the collaborative project established with a local traditional potter named David in the village of San Jose Sucuts, Belize in 2016 and 2017. The project outlined here will advance archaeological understandings of ceramic, ancient ceramics, develop a means by which local potters can share their knowledge and involve the local community in knowledge production regarding their own local history. Oh, excuse me, sorry about that. Further, this introduction of inclusivity into the design and execution of research will help ensure that the knowledge produced by the project is accessible to actors who have traditionally been excluded from academic discourse. Archaeological research has seen a general rise in collaborative project design, uh, methodology, and knowledge production alongside local communities. This trend is a result of our reflection, our self-reflection regarding the role of the discipline in past colonialism, as well as the modern socio-political context of the places in which we work. The call for collaboration is an effort to acknowledge descendant and local communities as major stakeholders in the investigation of the past and maintenance of the present present and future. A long-standing example of collaborative ceramic studies comes from Mexico. Uh, Dean Arnold, an ethnoarchaeologist who has worked with the same group of traditional Maya potters in Tikul, Yucatan, uh, for more than 40 years, has been at the forefront of integrating living heritage with archaeological evidence of ceramic production. In a recent publication, Arnold stresses the insights gained from close and long-term collaboration with Tikul potters, including the importance of landscape meaning and socio-cultural context in potter's choice of production material. Traditionally, archeological interpretations of ancient ceramic productions um, and even wider economic systems, they really center on models of efficiency. However, collaboration with living traditional potters makes it clear that material choice is not based solely on ease of access or even resource proximity, 
but on a deep understanding of the material, the location of the resource on the landscape, and the intended function of the vessel. Consideration of material choice is important for the archaeological study of ceramics um, as it speaks against models of absolute efficiency and highlights the essential nature of choice, agency, and expertise of the potter. However, insights such as Arnold's are gained through multiple decades of community collaboration and engagement. Um, these are, you know, really engaged with local communities of potters that maintain this tradition, a traditional method of production. So the convergence of traditional knowledge, living heritage, archaeological data, and scientific methodology is the framework upon which I have designed uh, my collaborative project in the village of San Jose Sukuts. The potters with whom I collaborated most closely for this project are David and Estrella Magana. Some of my fellow presenters and audience members may be familiar with the crafting legacy of the Magana family, uh, both in Sukuts and in the broader Lucayo district. David and his wife Estrella are master potters who often utilize traditional techniques like hand formation and open pit firing, um, in addition to more modern wheel and kiln production methods. I first contacted David and Estrella in 2016 uh, because of their interest in the archaeological past of their village, uh, safeguarding artistic traditions, and their deep knowledge of local clay and temper resources that may even have been um, accessed prehistorically. In 2016, David and I discussed potential sources of clay to test. Uh, while brainstorming the kinds of clay sources we wanted to incorporate in the study, David also shared his family's long tradition of pottery, the long distances his grandmother would travel for very specific materials, including um, clays and sands all the way from Flores, uh, Guatemala, and even his and Estrella's efforts to revitalize traditional pottery making in Sukkot. During the 2017 field season, I worked closely with David to access and work with local clays surrounding Shinantanich in the village. Uh, our goal was to collect and process the clay, create tiles, and fire them under different atmospheric conditions. Uh, we decided to process the tiles in different ways so that we could compare them to the ancient ceramics I had already, already excavated from the nearby sites of early Shinantanich and San Lorenzo. We collected from a total of five clay sources, three of which David accessed regularly for his own work, and two that were discovered through archaeological excavation. The first source, called San Lorenzo in this project, um, was discovered during a geological uh, survey conducted by UT, UT Austin graduate Leila Don. The clay deposit found at the site of San Lorenzo uh, was found with a backhoe trench in context with pre-classic shirts. So it may be that this, this uh, clay deposit was accessible in the pre-classic period. The second source was located on, uh, on a bank near the river. Uh, it was actually close to the Sukkot's ball court, uh, basketball court, if you all are familiar with that. Uh, this clay was yellow in its raw state and had a looser texture than any of the clays tested so far. That's why we collected it, just because it was a really unique um, deposit. Our third source was accessible from a bank as well, and it was located on a property belonging to the Sosa family of Sukuts. With their permission, of course, uh, we collected the clay, which was yellow like the basketball court um, clay, but had a much firmer texture. So we wanted to kind of compare these two to see how they would behave differently. Uh, because the, cl the clay was accessible by a cut in the road, David actually dug a bit deeper into the deposit to access clay that wouldn't have been um, altered by any environmental factors like exhaust from the road or washout from further up the hill. The fourth source was also buried archeologically. This was a um, source from a clay layer just above bedrock at early Shinantinich. We collected a sample of the thick dark material from below structure E2 at the site um, because it was accessible in, um, in excavations that were open at the time. I targeted this sample because evidence of a burning event that we also saw there um, seems to have fired the clay to nearly the exact color and texture of the savanna orange type, uh, which is a type of ceramic that's widely found in the region during the Middle Pre-Classic period. So this bright orange chunk, <laughs> essentially, of, of fired clay really stood out against this black, the black clay that was already there. 
And it led David and I to have a really deep curiosity about how this clay would react to the firing process. Uh, finally, the last source is the one that was most often utilized by David. It's lo located at Clarissa Falls, um, a lodge near Aktun Khan. And it's uh, the furthest from Shinantich in this uh, study. This deposit is quite large and is visible from the satellite uh, imagery. So you can see it here. This is actually the clay deposit. Um, but whether it was available in pre to pre-classic potters is as of now unknown. So once we collected the clays, um, David and Australia walked me through the process of um, how they would prepare it for forming and firing. First, the clay was soaked in large vessels that allowed it to settle to the bottom and the water to be sponged off the top. At this stage, large inclusions like rocks and twigs were sifted out. Um, though the clay obviously wasn't been in its natural state, 100% natural state, um, minimal levigation is necessary to ensure correct firing. And this kind of processing would have been necessary to ancient fires as well. After um, being levigated, W created small tiles from processed clay and marked, uh, and we marked each tile with its source. Um, we then fired the tiles in a fogon or hearth that David had in his workshop. The tiles were heated on a plate above the fire first to ensure they didn't crack with the temperature shock. Um, David taught me that this is this helped prevent wasters, but that explosions in the firing process were still bound to happen. Um, and likely did in the past as well. Once uh, the tiles started to turn red, which was the prime indicator of readiness, according to Estrella, uh, they were put directly into the flame. A few of the tiles did break in the process, uh, though the extent of damage really only included cracking and there wasn't any full like internal bursting. Um, overall, the tiles behaved predictably and the firing and fired to a varying range of oranges and light brown, which is a, kind of a common range of ceramics in the region, especially during the middle pre-classic period. Uh, some tiles were removed um, and placed into a pile of sawdust to create a reduced atmosphere. This did turn them very uh, black, which likely points to a method um, used by ancient potters to create some of the black wares that we do find. But since that's not really the focus of my dissertation project, those are going to be put to the side uh, for later analysis. So for a pilot study, I actually sent in a couple of the tiles along with a few archaeological sherds to Wagner Petrographic to create ceramic thin sections. Using a petrographic microscope, I assessed the mineralogical characteristics of the ceramic materials. I sent the tiles to be thin sectioned because I wanted to get kind of a comparison between the clay sources that are there and the archeological um, ceramics that we, we have excavated. And so looking at the slides from the five modern tiles, we're able to see what natural inclusions are present in the local clays surrounding Shenantich. Uh, there's still a lot, to be, a lot to be done in this investigation. The most crucial next step will be to perform point count analysis on this sample of slides. Um, because it allows us to see the mathematical proportions of, of the minerals and the mineral composition, um, which will help better define kind of the, the categories of, of fabrics that we're seeing um, and, and add a statistical significance to any results that we find. Um, unfortunately, David Magania is no longer with us. His death is really a great loss for the community of Sukkot's in our project. It's my hope that David's love of his craft and interest in archaeological history of the village will encourage future collaboration between heritage communities and archaeologists there. Um, this collaboration will only increase our understanding of the past and the sustainability of future projects. Thank you so much.